The next several videos are going to be about Grover's algorithm, which is one of the most famous algorithms in quantum computing. So let's look at the problem that it solves. Suppose we have some function f whose domain is the integers between 0 and 2 to the n minus 1. And f of x is equal to 0 for all of these values of x except for some special value x star. And f of x star is equal to 1. The problem that Grover's algorithm solves is finding this special value of x, x star. Now, all we can do with f is evaluate it. We don't have any further information about it. We can't look inside it to see how it's implemented. All we can do is pass in a value of x and see if it returns one or zero. Given this constraint, the most efficient way to solve this problem is just to try all values of x sequentially until f returns one for one of them. You could also try random values of x, but without keeping track of what values you've already tried, you may try the same value multiple times. So let's take a look at what the solution looks like. I'm going to demonstrate it in the programming language Python because it's relatively easy to understand even if you don't have prior experience with the language. So let's say that we're dealing with n equals 5. So our x's are going to be in the range 0 to 31. So x's is now just a list of all of the possible values of x that f is defined over. Um, let's define our function f. So remember that for some special value of x, f will return one, but for all other values of x, f returns zero. So let's just pick a special value. Let's say um, x star is equal to eight. So if x is equal to our special value, we'll return a one, otherwise we'll return a zero. All right, so let's Let's get around to writing up the algorithm that we just talked about. Call it solve it. Um, so we said the most efficient way to solve this problem is to sequentially try all values of x. So we're gonna go through all the possible values of x. We're going to evaluate f of x. And if it's equal to one, then we'll return that special value. Otherwise, we move on to trying the next one. So let's see if this actually works. So to find our special x, we'll just call the algorithm that we just wrote. Um, let me open up a terminal and run it. Sure enough, our algorithm succeeded. It found the special value of x. Now at this point, you may be confused because this seems kind of pointless, right? If we can evaluate this function f of x, then we can see what the special value is. Right here, I can just look at the code and see that eight is a special value. We don't need a fancy algorithm to tell us that. One response to this is just to say that f is supposed to be a black box. Its internals are supposed to be concealed. So even though in this example, we can look and see what f is doing, the problem that Grover's algorithm solves assumes that f is a complete black box, so you can't look inside of it. So in that case, we would have to run our algorithm to find x star. To me, that's not a very compelling answer because it makes this algorithm seem very impractical. How often do we come across a black box like this that has some special input it responds to and we want to find what that special input is. So I don't particularly like that answer. I think a better answer is that this problem is equivalent to function inversion, which is a practical problem. Say we have a function g of x whose domain is also zero through two to the n minus one for some n. 
And we know that there's some value of x that produces a particular output y. And we're interested in finding that value of x given y. Now this is a practical problem because there's many functions that we know how to compute but we don't know how to invert. So that means we can't solve this problem efficiently. So to see how this is equivalent to the first problem we talked about, we could define a function f of x that first computes g and then compares that to the value y we're interested in finding. And if the value of g of x is equal to y, then we can return one. And if it isn't, we can return zero. So you see that this problem of function inversion is equivalent to the first problem we talked about. This is actually why Grover initially called his algorithm one for database search. In this case, g functions as the database. Um, y is an entry in the database we're interested in finding. And the problem is to find the index into the database that produces this entry. And that would be that special value x star. Now I want to give a more concrete example of this. Uh, first, because I think it's interesting, but also because you'll sometimes find cryptic brief comments in descriptions of Grover's algorithm that mention without any explanation that Grover's algorithm can be used to crack passwords as well. A famous example of wanting to find the inverse of a difficult to invert function is in password cracking. When a database or your local computer stores your password, they don't actually store it in plain text. So there's not a file on the database that just has a list of everyone's passwords for you to see because that wouldn't be very secure. So what happens is your plain text password first gets pushed through a hash function. And a hash function is just um, a difficult to invert function. Um, it also has certain other properties like nearby inputs don't go to nearby outputs because that would make it easier to invert. And this hashed version of your password is what is actually stored. And when you have to supply your password again, the password you supply is hashed and then the hash code from your supplied password is compared to the stored hash code. And if those two match, then you entered the correct password. So what's really stored is these hashes, not your plain text passcode. Now suppose a hacker some way or another gets a hold of this file containing your hashed passwords. Password cracking refers to finding the passwords that correspond to those hashes. And there's not really an efficient way to do this. That's how hash functions are designed. They're designed so that they're difficult to invert, so that you're not totally out of luck even if someone does obtain this password file. So let's see how our algorithm cracks passwords. So first let's do an implementation of that function inversion that we talked about earlier. So we have some special value of y and we want to find the input to g that produces this special value of y. So we also have some new function g of x and this is just some difficult to invert function. And it's the one that we want to find input to that produces this special output. Then we said we're gonna modify our definition of f such that the first thing f does is it computes g of x, and then it compares that output, namely g of x, to the value that we're looking for, which is y. And if they're the same, it returns one, otherwise it returns zero. So now if we run solve it, it will invert this function g to find the value x 
such that g of x is equal to whatever we set y to be here. In the example of cracking passwords, this difficult to invert function we're after is the hash function. Now, there's many different hash functions out there that have been in use, um, and Python provides implementations for a lot of them. Uh, the one I'll be using is called MD5, so let's take a look at how that works. There's a module called MD5 that Python has that allows you to compute the MD5 hash of whatever you feed into it. So let's make a new MD5 object. And let's feed it some input. Let's say our password is password. And then we can look at what the hash is. So this is what the hash value of this password would be. So this is what would actually be stored on disk. Um, let me just illustrate how difficult the problem of inverting these is. Let's say we have a similar password, maybe password zero. And let's look at what its hash code is. So you can see that it hashes to something entirely different. <laughs> so even though these passwords are very nearby, just off by one character, their hash codes are incredibly different. So knowing what a hash code looks like doesn't tell you anything about what the password looks like. So let's say you broke into my machine um, and you found this passwords file and you see that there's some hash stored here and you want to find out what my password is. Um, as we said, this is a difficult problem because you have to find an input into that hash function that produces this output. Let's see if our algorithm can do it. So in this case, the special value of y we're looking for is this output, my hashed password. Um, x's are no longer in this range, Let's, our access are gonna be potential passwords. So maybe my password is password, maybe it's dog or pony or one, two, three, four. Um, I'll tell you it's one of these things. Okay, so g of x is our difficult to invert function. We said this is gonna be the hash function. So let's do what we did in the console get a new MD5 object, update it with our input, and then return the digest, which it just computes the hash function. Um, we have to use the MD5 module. Um, and now we should be good to go. This should crack the password. If, if my password is one of these values of X, then our algorithm should find it. Let's see if it does. Pony, that is indeed my password. Let's just verify. So let's start up the Python console again, import MD5. Let's put in my alleged password of Pony and then compute the hash on it. Um, and let's see if this matches what we've saw in the file. It looks like it does. So, our algorithm successfully cracked a password. So I hope that makes this problem seem a little less artificial and gets you excited about studying Grover's algorithm, which provides a more efficient solution to this problem than just trying all values of X, which is really the best way you can solve this problem classically.